end this presentation, let's consider each joint and think about what's moving each joint. Could you identify which muscle is moving each joint of each finger? Could you tell me what's primary and secondary? We go back to this illustration where we remember that it's extrinsic for extension of the MP joint, but the IP joints are intrinsic and the exact opposite is true for the flexors. Another way to look at it is we look at the MP joints and the IP joints. Extension is extrinsic and flexion is intrinsic. Extension is intrinsic for IP, flexion is extrinsic. There are a number of ways to look at this and to remember this. I'm going through each joint. We're looking at MP joint extension. It is extrinsic only. The extensor digitorum is the sole extensor of the MP joint as a result of its insertion through the sagittal bands. There is, however, an intrinsic muscle check rein of the interosseous that normally help prevent the hyperextension that would occur if that were not present. Hyperextension is a weak motion and it cannot be maintained against resistance because it is this mechanically less efficient insertion into the dorsal aspect of the proximal phalanx. What about MP joint flexion? Flexion of the metacarpal phalangeal joint or the proximal phalanx is chiefly achieved by the interosseous muscles. The interosseous muscles are the prime MP joint flexor. Their tendons are volar to the axis at the MP joint and they reinforce what the extrinsic flexors are doing but they do it primarily often before the extrinsic flexors are there. The MP joint is the only joint where the extensor digitorum communis and the intrinsic muscles are antagonists. They work together at the distal joints. The position of MP flexion IP extension is called intrinsic plus because both the interossei and the lumbrical muscles are active but the interossei are dominating and they are flexing the MP joint. It is not correct to call this a lumbrical plus posture. MP joint flexion is primary for the interosseous muscle and the lumbrical FDS and FDP all can serve as secondary MP joint flexors. PIP joint extension. The oblique fibers which accept the intrinsic contribution of the interosseous and even a contribution a little bit here from the lumbrical with the conjoined lateral bands and the central slip extend the middle phalanx but simultaneously the lateral bands and their contribution are extending the DIP joint so PIP and DIP joint extension is simultaneous with MP extension, the role of the interosseous for PIP extension is variable and it is greater when the MP joint is extended than when it is flexed. When it is flexed, there is greater tension in the central slip passively and that contributes to PIP extension as well. When the MP joint is in extension, the central slip is actually not the tenses structure, the lateral bands are. Therefore, it's the tension in the entire dorsal apparatus that more effectively extends the IP joints, particularly the PIP joint, than it is the central slip insertion per se. So with the MP joint extended, when we're looking at PIP joint extension, the interosseous can be primary, the lumbrical is always active, and the EDC is secondary because it's constrained by the sagittal band. When the MP joint is flexed, the lumbrical is the more primary PIP extensor because the interosseous is busy flexing the MP joint. The EDC with MP joint flexion provides 
a more passive contribution. What about PIP joint flexion? That's very straightforward. The lateral bands have to be slack, they have to move volarly. That allows the tension to be at, on the central slip, but that has to allow the FDS or FDP to flex the PIP joint. Now I put a question mark here because we don't really know if the SDS is primary during finger flexion. It might, it might not be, and the FDP might be primary or it might be secondary. So I find it very difficult to say what is the primary PIP flexor during normal finger flexion. It can be one, it can be both, it can be one and not the other. DIP extension results from the lateral bands receiving power from the conjoined lateral bands. So there's an EDC contribution as well as intrinsic muscle contribution that extends the DIP joint. Another way to say this would be DIP joint extension is a result of tension in the entire dorsal apparatus. L the lateral bands go directly to the DIP joint in a rather straight line and therefore in my opinion the lumbrical muscle is often the primary DIP joint extensor. Secondary are the lateral bands to the distal phalanx that receive the contribution of the interosseous and the EDC. You can see that that contribution occurs, but it is not a direct line of pull. And even if there's an interosseous insertion into the lateral band, as on the ulnar side of each finger, this power is shared with these other fibers, and it is not just a lateral band pull. So for DIP joint extension, I would say the lumbrical is often a primary contributor, but we can never say it's doing it alone. The interosseous and the EDC are also always participating. Now, what about DIP joint flexion? That's a very easy one because the FDP is the only anatomical structure that is reaching to the DIP joint in order to flex it, and there is no secondary flexion power. Thank you.